Let us uh, read from verse 20 through the end of the chapter. Mark chapter uh, 11, verses 20 through the end of the chapter. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Verse 20, verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Verse 26, but if you do not forgive, neither, your, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Verse 28, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, so afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. Okay, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we worship thee, we praise thee, we thank you, Lord, for your word. This morning, as we have uh, read your word, we pray, O oh God, that you would uh, minister your word to our hearts. We pray, O oh God, in the light of your word, that we would examine ourselves. We would, Lord, um, we would correct ourselves and we would, Lord, walk in your ways, Lord. Please, Lord, give us the grace that uh, we may, Lord, have you as the Lord of our lives. Lord, visit us this morning as we meditate your word. Lord, help me, Lord, as I communicate thy truth to your people. Please build your church up. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So here we have this section where last week I had to rush through through the end. We were talking about uh, essentials, essentials for effective prayer, right? Um, I mentioned last week there are two important points that the Lord makes here. First is we must come to God with expectation. The second is we must come to God with, when we pray, we must come to God with reconciled relationships. I mentioned last week, before we actually go into these two points, I will talk uh, some other very key essentials and I mentioned First thing is, when we come in prayer, we must realize who we come to meet. We come to meet the eternal King. We must never forget that. God is in heaven, we are on earth. Heaven is His throne, earth is His, is his footstool. We are near His legs. God doesn't have legs, it's, a, uh, it's just a picture to say who we are. So we must always have this reverence. Secondly, knowing this glorious God, we must always approach Him in humility, contriteness and brokenness. The Pharisee's prayer was rejected in Luke 18 because he was comparing himself to other men. And he felt good. He looked at other people and he felt good. And with that confidence, he approaches God and God says, God doesn't listen to his prayer. When we come to God, seeing his majesty, we must see who we are. We are sinners. We must be broken over our sin. We must understand we have no merit. 
we must cry out from the depths of our heart, be merciful to me, a sinner. Yes, when we recognize our sin, we are broken. How can we have access into the presence of this living, holy God? It is through the atonement. It is through the blood of Christ. It is through the blood of Christ alone. This is very important. We must realize the, angel, the cherubim has this flaming sword in his hand. If we think because of anything we have in ourselves that we come to God's presence, we are there, then and there itself condemned. The cherubim, what does he do when you approach God in your merit? He has fire in his hand. He is a burning creature. He will burn you and me. All our merits are like filthy rags before the holy God. So when we approach God, it is through the atonement of Christ, through the sin offering of Christ alone, we can approach God. This is very, very important. Many times we forget that. For Christ's sake alone, we are accepted into His presence. This truth is mentioned many times in scripture. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me, by the Lord Jesus alone. Last week we read Romans 5 too. Through him, through him, through the Lord Jesus Christ alone, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Entering the presence of God is a grace. Entering the presence of God is an unmerited favor. No one can approach God. No one. If God allows us, it is because of the merits of Christ. Because of his atoning work on the cross, his blood covers our sins. And therefore, we enter into God's presence. No merit of ours, but all merit of Christ. I know that you don't like what I'm saying. But sorry, that's the way it works. It, that is the only way. Someone says, what are you talking about, Brother Gautam? I went all my life uh, to church. As far as I know, uh, I've obeyed all the commandments of God. Are you saying all that merit that I have, uh, I have attained all these years? Are you saying I still have to come through Christ? The answer is yes. None of our works can bring us into God's presence. None of our fastings can bring us into God's presence. None of our Lent observations all our life can bring us into God's presence. None whatsoever. It is Christ alone. The blood of Christ alone can bring us into God's presence. And so we need the atonement. We cannot bribe God. We cannot say, I give tithe every year. You know, the best, I, 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 I have a planned offering every month for missions. We cannot say because of my, my giving, if my finances, my planned giving, we can enter into God's presence. No, dear ones, all merits of ours are filthy rags in God's eyes. 
our sin must be covered, must be atoned for. And only through Christ we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And so the importance of the atonement. Coming back to Mark 11, here the Lord is teaching that when we come to God, we must believe, we must come with expectation. Verse 22, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and throw in, uh, uh, be taken up and thrown and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes what he says will come to pass it will be done for him therefore whatever i tell you you therefore i tell you whatever you ask in prayer believe that you have received it and it will be yours the lord is using a picture of a mountain and he's saying if you believe that this mountain would be would be thrown into the sea and if you do not doubt it will be done Obviously, the Lord is not talking about a physical mountain, right? Rather, he's saying that which you think is impossible. When you come to God in prayer, if you believe the Lord, if you pray in accordance to his will, it will be yours. And in the Bible, we see many examples. We're studying the book of Hezekiah, uh, book of Isaiah. We come across a king by the name Hezekiah. Sennacherib and his army surrounds Jerusalem. He has no hope whatsoever to fight this great king. What does he do? You read in Isaiah that he goes to the Lord in prayer. God sends a word through Isaiah to Hezekiah. God says, Sennacherib and his army, I'll take care of it. I will deliver you. I will deliver the city for my name's sake. There are so many instances where we see what is impossible for man. When the people of God cry out, God delivers. You remember the story in Esther. Here is Naaman. Here is a wicked man trying to uh, exterminate the people of God. The nation declares a fast. The nation cries out to God and God intervenes. God delivers the Israelites from the plot of this wicked man. The na whatever is impossible in man's eyes but if we come to God believing that he will act on our behalf God acts God works in his people's behalf we must come to God in expectation obviously the the most important thing is we must pray in accordance to his will the other point in Mark chapter 11 that we need to take note of is in verse 25 and 26. Here the point is, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. God is saying that when we come to God in prayer, we must examine ourselves if we have any bitterness in our heart. Have we forgiven those who have committed offenses against us? Or is there any grievance? Is there any bitterness in our heart? If we come to God carrying bitterness, carrying offenses, if we don't forgive people who have offended us, if we don't show mercy and grace to those who have offended us, the teaching here is God will not listen to our prayers 
and God will not extend his mercy and grace to us. Right? This is a serious thing, isn't it? Can you imagine not receiving mercy and grace from God? What happens if we don't receive mercy and grace from God? What happens if our prayers don't have access into the presence of God? We are lost. We perish. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through the end, the Lord Jesus teaches a parable. Matthew 18, verses 23 through 35, the Lord teaches a parable. Let us, uh, let us look at this portion. Let us read the entire parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who, owned, who owed him 10,000 talents. If you have footnotes in your Bible, if you look at the end, uh, in the footnotes, a talent was a monetary unit worth about 20 years wages. So how much did this man owe the king? If a talent is 20 years wages, he, owned, he owed 10,000 talents. So how many years worth of wages? All of us are engineers, come on. How many, how many years worth of wages? 200? 1,000? Years worth of wages. 200,000. How many, how many years do we live? If God grants us life, we are looking at 90. Right? So in other words, this man was unable to pay the, the debt he owed. Verse 25. <clears throat> and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Verse 26. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring, meaning begging, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. Have patience with me, I will pay you everything. Verse 27. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Here is, he owed 200,000 years worth of wages. The master knew that he could never pay it. And out of compassion, out of pity, he forgave his debt. Verse 28. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. If you again go back to the footnotes, a denarii is how much? A denarii was a day's wage for a laborer. So, 100 days labor. In other words, it's a very meager amount. This servant who, whose massive debt was forgiven had a debtor who owed 100 denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe, verse 29. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. In other words, this debtor is doing the same thing that this particular man did to the king. So his fellow servant, uh, verse 30, he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. In other words, this man whose enormous debt was forgiven would not forgive the debt of this man who was in debt to him. He put him in jail. Verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Verse 32, then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, 
I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? The king, the master is saying, I showed so much mercy to you. Should you not have shown the same mercy to someone who owed you very little compared to what you owed me? Verse 34, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Verse 35, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Isn't this very plain? So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. One of the things the gospel does to us is it heals us. Not only do we receive forgiveness, we extend forgiveness. And that extension of forgiveness heals us. Some of you grew up in, some of us, let's say, grew up in broken homes. And you have this, this bitterness. You have this bitterness towards your parents. And you're carrying it. As a person who has experienced this gospel, this must be a practical truth in our lives. Giving that bitterness to God. Asking God, Lord, this, this bitterness is too heavy. I cannot forgive. Please give me grace. Give me mercy so that I can forgive. Some of us are in marriages, let's say. And we have this unforgiveness towards spouses. The Lord desires that we must forgive our spouses. Some of us in churches have bitterness towards brothers and sisters in the Lord. The Lord tells you and me, to extend forgiveness, to show mercy, to forgive, to remove the bitterness from your heart. Last week we read Matthew 6. Um, Matthew 6 was 23 and 24. Matthew five twenty three and 24. If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. If you know something is wrong between a brother or sister in the Lord, between you and them. Here the Lord Jesus is teaching us, set yourself upright with them first. Then come and offer prayers, then come and offer your gift. This is practical Christianity. I know it is difficult to, to, to humble ourselves. It is difficult, but the Lord tells us we must do this. If you know you have offended somebody, 
I know it is very hard to humble yourself and say, I'm sorry, brother, I'm sorry, sister. And you know your relationship between you and that particular brother, sister is not right. The Lord tells us, first, go reconcile. Go in humility, tell your sorry. Be reconciled. Only then come and pray. This is Christianity 101, right? Christianity basics. The Lord says, we must have extend forgiveness. We must ask, so, uh, we must say sorry when we are wrong. And that applies to our kids as well. If we do something wrong to our, ki to our kids, it's okay to humble ourselves and say, I'm, I'm sorry in my anger I did this wrong. The Lord desires that we have reconciled relationships. We forgive others their sins, their offenses against us. We extend mercy towards those who have uh, sinned against us. Matthew 6, 12. This should be our prayer. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. It's very important that we forgive others. So the Lord is saying one of the important criteria for effective prayer one of the essentials for effective prayer is right relationships, reconciled relationships. And as we move on, in verses 27 through 33, we have a confrontation between the religious leaders and the Lord Jesus. The Lord is teaching in the temple area. We read that in Luke 21. The Lord is teaching about his kingdom. Luke 20, 20 Luke chapter 20, verse 1. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority do you do these things? Who gave you this authority? The Lord was teaching in the temple. He was teaching the way of grace. He was saying he was the way of salvation. He was pointing to himself as the means of salvation. And he's been doing that all through his ministry. We read many places in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy the Lord. Our Lord was teaching contrary to the traditions of that time. There was this, uh, if you will, opposition between the Lord and the religious leaders. The Lord was teaching the word of God, whereas the Pharisees and the religious leaders were teaching their traditions. Let us turn to Mark chapter 7. This is what the Lord is, is telling the religious leaders. Mark chapter 7 verse 8. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You leave the word of God. You leave the word. And you hold to the tradition of men. Verse 9. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. In other words, the, te the teachers, the religious leaders, were teaching the traditions of men. 
our Lord was teaching the word of God. And as he was teaching the word of God, these men are upset. These religious leaders are upset. And they come and ask him, By what authority do you teach these things? Who gave you this authority? You don't comply with us. You don't comply with our traditions. You don't comply with what we are telling. Who gave you this authority? You're disturbing the masses. Who gave you this authority? Who commissioned you to teach these things? We see our Lord, verse 29 onwards, the Lord saying, I will ask you one question, answer me. I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The Lord knew the hardness of their hearts. They are so rooted in the traditions of men. Man is their authority. And saying, I will, he knew the hardness of their hearts. And in compassion, he is trying to make them think. And he raises this question. I'll ask you a question. You answer, you answer me. I will tell you by what authority I do these things. As we look at this episode, there's one important point that we need to take note of. That point is this. False religion always opposes truth. False religion always opposes Christ. False religion always opposes Christianity. The way of man always opposes Christian message. It can have different clothing, but it ultimately has this one thing, that it would oppose Christ and his message. Now this is pictorial here, isn't it? Here are men holding on to false religion, a religion of men, made by men. They have deviated from the word of God. They made up their own system. Now when the truth comes, Christ comes and stands before them. What does false religion do? It tries to persecute Christ. It tries to persecute his message. Now I said, this is the principle here. And if you apply it to modern age, Every religion in the world opposes Christianity. Every philosophy made by man opposes Christianity. Atheism opposes Christianity. Every religion, you name it, opposes Christianity. False religion always opposes the Christian message. As Christians, you and I must not be surprised when a particular religion comes and says and attacks Christianity. That is the norm. Truth is always attacked. We see here the false religion, these man-made uh, religion opposing Christ and challenging his authority. Now someone might say, Brother Gautam, aren't these Jews, um, aren't, are you saying the Old Testament is against the, against the New Testament? I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to say is these men, these religious leaders were not even following the Old Testament. They are standing against the Old Testament. Look at John chapter 5. The Lord Jesus challenging these religious leaders. John chapter 5 verse 40, 46. For if you have believed Moses, you would believe me. So what is the Lord saying? The Lord Jesus is saying, if you believe Moses, in other words, if you believe the Old Testament, 
you would believe me for he wrote of me but if you do not believe his writings how would you believe my words so false religion always strays from the word of god in this case these religious leaders strayed from the word of god and now they are challenging christ and his message the point that we need to take note is how false religion opposes christ and his message now what how does the lord react how does the lord deal with these men the lord deals with compassion and here he poses a question he wants them to think was 30 was the baptism of john from heaven or from earth answer me in other words he is pointing them to a witness you know the john the baptist don't you you know zechariah's son don't you zechariah is a priest in the temple of god you know him don't you you know john came with a message John was filled with the Holy Spirit while he was still in the womb. He was a forerunner. He came with a message. He preached repentance. He preached that Jesus, me, I am the Messiah. He stood there on the banks of Jordan and he said, "Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world." he is the one who preached i must decrease he must increase you know that man don't you where is his authority from was the baptism of john from heaven or from man where is john's authority from do you believe it is from heaven or do you believe it is just one of the uh, false religions do you believe he is serving the true god or is he just making up stuff by himself we read these men uh, having a discussion the lord is making them think they knew john's baptism john's ministry was supernatural yet they wouldn't believe him he's pointing them to witness to show his his authenticity that is what god does even to this unbelieving world when we oppose the truth when we are in false religion when we oppose christ and his message god does the same thing to us just as he is doing to these religious leaders he comes to us with compassion and he puts witnesses around us who have been touched by him whose lives are supernatural to say that christianity is supernatural christianity is from heaven man cannot make this up that's how god works in our lives when we oppose him he is compassionate towards us he puts witnesses for his name sake around us but what does man in sin do he co- he comes up with his plans with his schemes so that he may not obey this truth and that's what we see here the religious leaders doing they are having a discussion verse 31 and they discussed it with one another if we say from heaven he will say why then did you not believe him if we say john's ministry is from heaven god sent him he's a prophet the, then the question would be yes john said i am the christ i am the lamb of god that take away the ways in the world why then did you not believe in him and they were so hardened that they don't want to say that the second alternative is 
if they say from man, they, they were in this audience where people who were listening knew John was, John's message is from heaven. They would be rejected by men if they say John's authority is from man, they would be rejected by men. And so they see they're in this dilemma and they basically do not want to give up their earthly positions. They loved the world and its positions. And to escape the, the dilemma, they said, verse 33, they answered Jesus, we do not know. So this is man in sin, always opposing the truth. When God reaches to him in compassion and makes him think, he doesn't want to, to examine things. He doesn't want to comply to the truth. Rather, he finds excuses. This is what the religious, we don't know. It's very plain, it's very simple. All they should have said is, John's baptism is from heaven. They should have accepted Christ and because John preached Christ as the Messiah. Jesus our Lord as the Messiah. But man in sin is hardened. He wouldn't. He would continue in unbelief. He wouldn't believe on the Lord Jesus. And that's what these men do. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority do I do these things. In other words, the Lord says, you know the answer. You don't want to believe. I will also not answer your question. In other words, they are left in their condemnation. They are left in sin without hope. As we look at these verses, what is our response to the Lord Jesus? Are you questioning his authority or are you complying with his authority? The Lord desires that we must come under his authority, comply to his authority. We must put our faith in him. We must trust Him for our salvation. We must believe who He is. He is the second person of the Godhead. He came into this world. He is the man from heaven. He came into this world, lived a perfect life. He paid the payment for our sin. He rose again on the third day to show He is God. He is ascended in heaven now. He is going to come soon. We must not be continuing in unbelief, questioning, challenging Christ and his message. Rather, we must accept John's testimony. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. We must believe in him. That is what the Lord desires of us. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we worship you, we praise you. Father, this uh, morning, Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, that we have hearts of unbelief, we, have, we are hardened because of sin, we are not able to see your glory, we are not able to see who you are. Lord, we pray that you would remove the scales that are on our hearts, that we would see who the Lord Jesus is. And we would not challenge him rather, but we would come under his authority. We would make him the Lord of our lives. We would not oppose him, rather we would submit to him. Please give us grace. Help us to live under his authority. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name.